What's happening, you wacky YouTube folk? I'm Mr. What, and not unlike a termite, I've crawled out of the woodwork to cover another FFmpeg synchronization topic. Also not unlike a termite, I'm so pale that direct sunlight will probably kill me. Down to business. Now, if you'd seen my previous video on using the Async TS filter to keep your audio from falling out of sync when doing a desktop recording, you've started using that filter but are still having problems, Say that the audio and video desynchronize by one or two seconds and stay that way throughout the recording, or the synchronization gets progressively worse as your recording goes on, may not be for the reason you think. Also, depending on how you spec out your recording script, you may be getting in the, your own way of being able to diagnose and fix the problem. Now, for the sake of example, I'm going to be focusing on gameplay recordings. That is kind of the thing nowadays, with all them wacky kids want to show off the elite skills, of which I have absolutely none. And to make matters worse, all the games that I do like are old, so I'm going to make you suffer through watching me play some good old tribes too. <laughs> At least one of us is going to be having fun during this. Anyway, um, just a little background on tribes too. It is a very old, and I'm talking about 15 years old, first-person shooter that's very fast-paced and relies a lot on the Z-axis. So it's a free-look type. Whenever you're playing the game, the camera's kind of moving all over the place. I attempted to do some recordings of this game at 30 frames per second, and to be completely honest, it didn't look very good. Now, not that I was having any problems with the recording itself, but because of the fact that there was so much video data missing, it kind of gave me motion sickness trying to watch the resulting video. So a game like this is better suited for full HD recordings. That's 1920 by 1080 at 60 frames per second instead of 30 frames per second. Now, if I wanted to record something like that, a script would be set up s similar to this one. Pretty basic stuff. I only have one pulse audio input specified just so I can grab the desktop audio. X11 grab string I have set up here for a 60-second uh, frame rate and 1920 by 1080 as mentioned. I am using the Async TS filter because I wanted to keep the audio synchronized as this went along. And as far as the LibX264 settings, I went with my de facto standard here. That's the very fast preset with a constant rate factor of 18. These are the specs that I most commonly use when doing 30 frame per second recording. So I figured for 60 frame per second, let's take a crack at it. And I am using the YUV420 planar pixel format just in case anything I did record I wanted to put up on YouTube later. Now, Tribes' uh, in-game audio is very, very low res, so I just went with 128K fixed bitrate MP3 for the audio, and then I'm outputting to an MKV file. So, let us take a quick look at the results here. Using that particular script, uh, this is the video that was generated, and let's pay attention to the audio. 15 seconds. Hi! Hello. So, as far as audio and video Ten sync seconds. goes, everything is fine so far. Five, four, three, match begins now. Game starts. Hit up the old inventory station. I'm running out onto the playfield, and if you listen closely to the footfalls, you'll hear that the audio and video have fallen out of sync almost immediately. If I move forward a couple of ticks, you can get a better idea of just how bad it's gotten in a short amount of time. You hear how long the delay was between when my character took the shot and you actually heard the audio of that shot come through? Let's push forward a little bit. At this point in the recording, the audio and video are so completely out of sync that it's ridiculous. Let's go ahead and quit this. So what went wrong? Well, because of the fact that I had that Async TS filter in place in my recording script, I can pretty much guarantee that it wasn't an audio problem. If it was, then Async TS would have resynced the audio after a period of time. That's what Async TS does. So, by process of elimination, that pretty much means that what I'm running into is a video synchronization problem. And what's causing that? We flip back over to the script here. The culprit lies right here, using R60 to specify the input frame rate for the X11 grab string. If we take a look at FFmpeg's documentation on the dash R option, 
It reads, as an input option, ignore any timestamp stored in the file and instead generate timestamps assuming a constant frame rate of FPS, or whatever you set. This is not the same as the dash frame rate option used for some input formats like Image2 or V4L2, or even though it doesn't say it, X11 grab. If in doubt, use the dash frame rate instead of the input option dash R. Another thing that I want to note here, because it's equally important, as an output option, duplicate or drop input frames to achieve constant output frame rate of FPS. Now something that the documentation doesn't mention about using dash R on a live input like X11 grab is that it opens the door for video frames to be dropped at ingest. That's a problem because if any video information gets cut out from the rest of the encoding string, it doesn't make it to the X264 encoder, and especially the muxer, that's the process where the encoded audio stream, the encoded video stream get merged into a container, in this particular case an MKV file, uh, then the audio and video don't have proper synchronization points. Now in order to overcome this, let's flip back over here, Let's go ahead and run a test, and I'm going to replace dash R with dash frame rate. And just for the sake of argument, I'm also going to turn on logging for this next recording example. Now you can turn on logging by either using a report option, so just right at the, after the FFmpeg command, dash report, EOR, damn it, there we go, like that. That'll generate a pre-named log in whatever location that your terminal happens to be parked at. So if I open up a terminal here, it's going to open up to my home directory. If I go ahead and kick off this recording script here, the log file is going to go into my home directory. If I change directories over to videos, and I kick the script off from here, then the log is going to go into my videos directory, even though I may have uh, the actual output file going to a completely different location. I don't really like that particular process, so what I do instead is use a temporary variable called ffreport. And this has to be placed before the actual FFmpeg command. So it's FF report in all caps, then file equals. And then what I can do here to make certain that the output file and the log go to the same place is I can just go ahead and copy the path and general file name. I'll just replace the extension with dot log. And then I would go ahead and throw a backslash space on a bash that space and a backslash after that. Anyway. When you turn on logging for FFmpeg recordings, it's going to default to a uh, logging level called verbose. And for these particular exercises that I've been running through, verbose puts out too much information to sort through. So what I like to do is trim this down to a level that is equivalent to the information that you're getting out of your terminal whenever you're running the script. And that level is called info, I-N-F-O. There's a numeric uh, value for this too, and that's 32. Now the default, if I didn't have this level um, parameter set here, would be verbose, or the numeric equivalent would be 40, and there's a couple other levels above that put out a ridiculous amount of information that I'm not gonna worry about too much. So I'm just gonna keep this at level 32. So there it is, FF report, this has to be in all caps, equals file, which has to be all lowercase, there is the path that you want uh, to drop your log file into, file name.log, and if you want to set a level, you end this with a colon, no spaces, the word level, and then either nu a numeric or an alpha uh, representation of the log level. So I'm going for info32. Anyway, let's take a look at the uh, results from this particular script here. Okay, pretty much the same pathing that I was using before. Footfalls are all in the same place as they were before, so... So far, so good. The video quality is kind of chunky. But at the same time, the audio and video are all staying in sync. Okay, now how constant is this? If I go ahead and I push forward to anywhere in the recording, let's just keep skipping. Right to my <laughs> glorious death scene. 
the audio and the video remained in synchronization during all of that. Let's push forward some more. That was a missed opportunity. Push forward some more. <laughs> and I'm dead again. <laughs> I always have the tendency to celebrate that. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so when it comes down to it, changing out dash R for dash frame rate solved the audio and video synchronization problem. But it doesn't end there. If I flip back over here, let's go ahead and take a look. Now, I did generate logs when I was doing that particular recording, so let's take a look at those. There we go. So here is the log file. And if I scroll down through this thing, and everything looks fairly normal until about one minute and nine seconds into the recording. Suddenly I get this warning message saying that thread message queue blocking on the X11 grab string, consider raising the thread queue size option to current value 8. Okay. And then, shortly after, I start dropping frames. You also notice that we have these past duration to large warnings that are coming through. These are coming out of the Muxer process. And they're effectively saying that, you know, the video frame that I've been fed has a timestamp which is too far off uh, from a 60 frame per second frame rate that's been specified. If that pass duration gets to 1.1 frames too large, then a frame gets dropped. If we keep scrolling down here, you'll see that, okay, dropped one frame there, I get down to 1 minute and 11 seconds, I've dropped three frames keep going down the line here still at three frames now I keep scrolling down I'm at one minute and 55 seconds I'm at 43 frames now, I've taken all of these uh, messages out and I put them into a separate file to make them easier to read here so just taking a look at all the actual frame output messages that have been coming through so we dropped one, we dropped three, we were dropped 10, 11, 12, 22, 24, 26, 28, and it just keeps getting worse. And another thing that you'll notice is that the frames per second rating is dropping. So I started out at 60, but now it's at 57. If I scroll all the way to the bottom of this thing, which is the end of the recording, it's only about 11 minutes long, I've dropped from 60 frames a second to 55 frames per second. Okay, so... At the end of the day, using the dash frame rate option kept the audio and video synchronized, but I'm still dropping a lot of frames. Now, before we go too much further, I do want to mention using the dash R option in the X11 grab as an input previously was not the culprit for frame drops. Because of the fact that frames were getting dropped, it opened the door for audio and video to desynchronize using that particular setting. If I wasn't dropping any video frames and I was still using dash R, then I wouldn't have any problems with the audio and video falling out of phase. But at the end of the day, I'm just still dropping a lot of frames. So why is that? The short answer is because the LibX264 encoder is overwhelming my system at the settings used. Let's flip back over here. I'm going to flip up to the uh, recording script here. Now I mentioned previously in the LibX264 settings that pre, uh, using the very fast preset with a constant rate factor of 18 is my de facto standard. Now, most of the recordings that I do are 30 frames per second, and I do not have any problems with frame drops at that particular rate. But why would there be such a problem at 60 frames per second using preset very fast at CRF18 if I'm not having those problems with 30? Well, the short answer to that is the fact that um, the load that the X264 encoder puts on one system is dependent on how different each frame in a video recording is. Now, that probably doesn't going to make a hell of a lot of sense going into it, so I put together a little demonstration here. Using those exact same specs, I went ahead and I did a screen recording of just me playing back some video files which uh, have different levels of change from frame to frame. The first thing I'm going to start here with is just that async TS video that I put out a while back. This was recorded at 30 frames per second, but I am doing a 60 frame per second grab of it, so the strain should be relatively light. If you take a look in the lower right corner where the mouse pointer is, you'll see that little black box that says Usage 32. That's a system load applet. 
And so what we're going to do is I play this video, keep your eye on that, and you'll notice that as I change over from one video source to another, which is puts more strain on the X264 encoder, that usage load is going to increase. So let's go ahead and fire this off. Down to St. James Infirmary. Okay, now anybody who did watch this video previously is probably completely sick of hearing this song, so I'm going to go ahead and pause it here. But if you did keep your eye on that usage flag in the lower corner, you'll notice that it didn't really go above 32-35% as the uh, recording went on. So let's move ahead to something a little more challenging, about 2 minutes and 10 seconds. There we go. So uh, what I've got here is an example of Big Buck Bunny, the Sunflower Edition. Uh, being played in the background and there is considerably more change from frame to frame in the video but we have a lot of smooth pans and uh, smooth zooms and that kind of thing a lot of linear motion where it's either moving one direction or another but not several at the same time so let's go ahead and start this and keep your eye on the usage and let's see what uh, let's see what type of uh, load it puts on the system You'll notice how the load is now peaking over 60% when I have these smooth zoom-ins. Okay, now it almost hit 70% when we had the scene change. Okay, you get the idea with that. So the, there is a considerable more difference between each frame in this particular video, and as those differences are pumped into the LibX264 encoder, it has to work harder to be able to keep up with them. So let's push forward. I'm going to go about 4 minutes and 25 seconds. And right about there, and lo and behold, we're on tribes again. Now keep a close eye on the load meter as this goes on. <laughs> Almost immediately, you get a lot of system up, ups and downs going with this. It jumped over 70%, it's going to 80, it's going to 90. You know, and a lot of those changes, that load increase, has to do with the fact that there is a considerably, a, a considerably more difference between each frame in a Twitch shooter like this. You know, with the um, Async TS video, the movement was limited to just one particular corner of the recording here. Big Buck Bunny had a little more load increase on it because it had those smooth left and right pans and zoom ins, but you know, the changes were relatively slow. You jump forward to Tribes 2, the changes between each frame are massively different because, you know, the uh, player's field of view is shifting all over the place up down left right caddy corner to the side however you put it now another thing that I'm going to mention about this load monitor is that it only reports uh, the system load in every tenth of a second so there's a lot going on in the background which it's not going to show if I go ahead, I'm going to go ahead and quit this and I did capture a log of this particular recording as well which is right here and you will notice that right about here, we're in the middle of the, uh, the range for that recording for the Tribes 2 portion, 4 minutes and 34 seconds. It started about 4 minutes and 25 seconds. I've started dropping frames. That was because the LibX264 system load had increased to the point where it was overwhelming my CPU. Okay, so now I have an idea of what type of load the LibX264 encoder is using with the very fast preset at CRF18 whenever I'm doing a Tribes 2 recording.
doesn't solve the problem, but it helps me diagnose it. So the next steps that I wanted to run through is to actually test a bunch of different options in LibX264 to determine what's appropriate for my system. So before we get too far into that, how about a little information on the system in question? Now I'm running an Intel Core i7-3770 on this particular rig. It's my daily driver. This is an Ivy Bridge chip running at 3.4 gigahertz with four physical cores plus hyper threading. So eight logical cores, eight cores is what FFmpeg sees and uses. I have 16 gigabytes of DDR3-1600 RAM. I am running an NVIDIA GeForce GT630 with a two gigabyte frame buffer and I am using the proprietary NVIDIA driver on Linux. And for storage, I have a Western Digital Black mechanical hard drive. The model number there is, uh, is there if you're curious. Now before anybody gets it into their heads that the hard drive might be a bottleneck, I'm going to point out a couple of quick things. This drive is rated at 1.2 gigabits per second of sustained sequential read-write throughput. That is a pie-in-the-sky number. That's a benchmark that Western Digital released. And it also is about a third the rate of a modern SSD. However, a LibX264 encoder of Tribes 2 gameplay using the ultra-fast preset at constant rate factor 18 outputs video at about 25 megabits per second. Now, I have not rated or attempted to test my hard drive or benchmark it to see if it's actually achieving that 1.2 gigabits per second of sustained uh, read-write throughput, but even if it was running at half capacity and I was using the ultra-fast at CRF18, which would be the highest and most disc-absorbing recording that I would ever use, even you know 600 megabits per second would be half of the ideal rate. 25 megabit per second video output is nowhere near that. This is not a bottleneck point. On to recordings themselves. Now, doing 30 frames per second, as I mentioned, my go-to standard is the very fast uh, preset with a constant rate factor of 18. Now, CRF18 is considered to be visually lossless, at least at the uh, pixel, um, pixel detail level, because of the fact that I'm using a YUV420 planar pixel format that's a lossly, has a lossy color space to it, so I can't really say that it's completely lossless, but the level of detail is up there, while the level of color is not. Now, I can use these settings for general purpose recordings of practically everything, and I do. I do not experience any frame drop problems at these settings unless I'm using a bicubic scaler. If I wanted to do a 1920 by 1080 recording and then in the recording string itself, uh, scale it down to say 720p, I would use a scaler. If I wanted to use a bicubic scaler, which is a specific option for higher quality scaling, that puts a considerable amount of load, additional load on the system. So if I used bicubic, it would over, uh, I'd start dropping frames. The default is bilinear. If I just use the default bilinear scaler, I do not have that problem. Um, using these particular settings has a reasonable impact on system performance, but it will affect games. What that means is that you know, when I am running a desktop recording at 30 frames per second at these settings, I definitely notice that my system is a little bit slower. Like, you know, If I want to open up a file or if I want to open up a video or something like that, there's a tiny little bit of lag that I feel. If I crack open a game and I start playing it while I'm doing one of these recordings, it starts dragging the performance of the game down. I don't drop frames, but the additional load that it puts on the system does have an adverse effect on gameplay. Now let's jump forward into 60 frame per second recordings. Now we've already pretty much discovered that using very fast and uh, CRF 18 can be problematic. Now the same range for a uh, constant rate factor is a CRF of 18 to 28. 18 would be considered visually lossless, 28 would be considered passable. You'd really have to run your own recordings and take a look and see what constant rate factor values work for you. Some people are perfectly happy with 28. I'm not. <laughs> anyway, if I'm using these settings, you know, within that CRF range and very fast, I can use this for recording simple desktop actions or low impact video playback. So think basic podcasting kind of stuff. However, I'd probably question using 60 frames per second at this particular preset. You know, it doesn't really seem worth it unless somebody is absolutely rabid for full HD content at 60 frames per second. If I'm just, you know, typing out scripts or something like that, it doesn't make any sense. I just go ahead and drop back to 30 frames per second. Now, this has a definite higher impact on system performance. You know, my programs launch slower. 
it's felt a lot more than if I was running uh, 30 frame per second at very fast. Frame drops are likely if recording complex or fast motion video, as we saw with Tribes 2, or with a system load increase. So let's say, for instance, that I open up a web browser or something like that, uh, cold, I start at cold, and I go to YouTube and I start playing a 60 frame per second video there, just the system load that gets put on by the web browser opening and then going to YouTube and loading that content can tip the, uh, the frame drop threshold over the edge and then I'll start dropping frames. Gameplay recordings are practically guaranteed frame drops when using this preset. I would not use this particular preset on this machine to record a game. Okay, continuing on 60 frames per second. The super fast preset. This seems to be the sweet spot for the majority of things that I would do for 60 frames per second. I can use super fast with a constant rate factor of 18 to 28 for general purpose recording of most activities. I do not have any frame drop problems, but there is a higher system performance impact with lower CRF values. So if I was using CRF 18, 19, 20, 21 or something like that, and I open up programs, I'll definitely notice the, uh, the impact there. The output file size, and this is important to me because I do all my recordings locally, is significantly increased. It's about 55 to 75 percent larger than very fast. Considering the fact that I probably pumped out about 110 gigabytes worth of video recordings running all the tests that I used to put this together, yeah, that's, uh, that's a consideration. <laughs> Gameplay recordings are best balanced using a constant rate factor of 24. Now, this is, it took a long time to get to this point, but I am satisfied with using CRF24. I'm satisfied with the video quality. I'm satisfied with the system impact that it puts out. And the file size isn't that unreasonable. It's about 3.6 gigabytes per hour, a gigabyte being 1024 to the third. And as far as the megabits per second rate, it's about 8.6 megabits per second being multiples of 1,000. And I can also use these uh, super fast for slightly more demanding recordings, such as a single webcam overlay at 320 by 240 or 640 by 480 resolutions. If I try to do two cameras or you know try to do a weird compositing thing like that, then it has a tendency to lead to frame drops. On that note, ultra fast. The ultra fast preset using a CRF 18 to 28 range. This is what I would use for demanding recordings only, such as using a bicubic scaler and padding X11 grab input plus two webcam overlays and a composited scene. That looks like this. Well, at least I got a piece of them. And if that isn't a complete demonstration of utter vanity, I don't know what is. <laughs> All right, and then final note on this, the output file size when using UltraFast is absolutely huge. It's 70 to 103 uh, 70 to 103% larger than very fast. So, it's going to eat up a hell of a lot of disk in a short amount of time. So, anyway, super fast is what I would want to go for. Now, once I'd finished running through all these exercises to determine exactly what my system was capable of doing, and I felt confident that I could put together a LibX264 encoding string that wouldn't drop frames, one of the things that I did is I went back to my X11 grab string and I changed dash frame rate back to dash R. You may be asking yourself, now why would I do that when dash R caused so many problems at the very beginning of all this? Well, dash R has a particular value in the fact that it generates clean timestamps, and that's beneficial to the other processes in the recording script. Now, when you are pulling in video from a live input source, like a webcam or X11 grab, uh, the timestamp data that comes with each video frame can be dirty. That means that it doesn't match up with the frame rate that you specify. So you'd think that you know, whenever you get these timestamps coming through that they would match frame for frame by whatever timestamp makes the most sense. The first uh, frame that gets pulled in would be 1 divided by 60, that's the time base. The second frame that gets pulled in would be 2 divided by 60, etc, etc, etc. But when you have these live encoding sources, these live video sources, they have a tendency to have variance in their timestamps. That creates an additional amount of load on the muxer end of the uh, encoding script. So let's flip over here. If you remember these warning messages that I pointed out earlier, these past duration too large uh, indicators here, 
those are coming from the muxer saying that the timestamp data is kind of teetering on the edge of being problematic and it means that it is paying attention and therefore eating up more system resources trying to pay attention to this using dash r eliminates these messages coming through and it makes it easier on the muxer to determine okay this timestamp is clean it matches up with the audio here i can just push these uh, these particular frames directly into the muxer and everything is all, uh, into the mux file everything is perfectly fine any opportunity that i'd have to lighten the system load by that much more i consider to be valuable now as long as we're talking about making changes and tweaks if i flip back over to uh, the one log file that i did of the first tribes recording using dash frame rate if you remember this particular warning that i pointed out it said that the thread message queue blocking consider rating raising the thread queue size option well that can provide a little bit of an additional relief to the encoding string as well thread queue size is a per input option so if i wanted to apply it to x11 grab i just lead it off with thread underscore q q u e u e size and then i'd specify a numeric value the default is eight so if i don't have this set at all wait a second there we go if i don't have that set at all it's going to apply the value of eight to each uh, incoming uh, to the thread queue size of each input so let's put that back in there Put that in there we go now the first time that I tried monkeying this with this, I started setting arbitrary numbers, like, you know, 1024. That didn't seem to help at all. There seems to be a threshold that isn't documented anywhere, so there's kind of a sweet spot for setting these things. So what I ended up doing is I just kept that end up doubling the number, so thread queue size from 8 to 16, and then I checked the logs, I was still getting messages. So then I doubled that, so thread queue size 32, still got messages. Thread queue size 64, that seemed to be where the X11 grab needed to be. Now, if I wanted to set thread queue size on the pulse input, like I said, these are per input, so I'd have to lead off this particular input with the same parameter, QUE, UE, size, and then I could do 16 or whatever value that made the most sense. However, I will note that, let's flip back down over here and go to the very top, page up, page up, page up, page up. There we go. In every recording that I did, regardless of what the thread queue size option was set to, Pulse Audio always threw these messages at the very beginning. It didn't seem to affect the, uh, the audio quality or the audio synchronization in the recording, so I consider these to be false positives and just ended up going back to setting the def or leaving these things at default of 8 by just not setting them. Now, as I mentioned previously, for recording Tribes 2 gameplay, Using an X264 preset of super fast rather than very fast, a CPER, and a constant rate factor value of 24 provided the most, the best balanced recording. So, a reasonable amount of system impact, decent video size, and decent video quality. So, I went ahead and I recorded a sample of that, depending on what YouTube does to it after this gets transcoded. I wanted you to have a look at it and judge for yourself. I think it's pretty good. A little rough around the edges, maybe, but I'm completely satisfied with it. So, you take a look and let me know what you think. You are watching this at 1080p60, right? <laughs>
Up to this point, I've been using Tribes 2 as my game of choice for all these tests and demonstrations, but I've also mentioned that running these desktop recordings can put a load on your system that affects gameplay. Now, Tribes 2 isn't the best game to use to demonstrate that because it has incredibly low system requirements. Considering its age, I mean, I think the original minimum specs were something like a 400 megahertz Pentium 2 with 16 megs of RAM. So, to give you a better idea as to what type of strain a desktop recording can put on your system, let's use something that was re released in the last decade, Half-Life 2 Lost Coast. Now, normally, when I'm playing this game without running a recording, I can just leave it at the recommending video settings, which are usually very high, and I can play it at full 1080, so full screen. When I'm running a desktop recording, I'm either using very fast at 30 frames per second or super fast at uh, 60 frames per second, in order to make this game playable, what I have to do is take it out of full screen mode, scale it down to 720p, and drop all the graphics settings to medium. Now, like I said, it makes the game playable, but it doesn't remain that way throughout the entire experience. Let's take a look at this. I do love those laser guided missiles. Anyway, if you notice the steam overlay in the upper left corner of the video window here, that's a 60 frames per second. I did have that active throughout the entire recording. So that wasn't a particularly strenuous point of the game. So let's jump forward to some point that is up in the cathedral here. And about there. Now normally at this point of the game, um, is the this is where the heaviest amount of load is put on my system and my frames per second usually drops when I'm playing this at 1080p to somewhere in the 50 range. Now if you watch the frames per second as I run through this particular scenario when the load starts increasing you'll see that the frame rate drops considerably beyond that. Okay, we're at 59, 57, 51, 53, 51, 50, 51, 49, 49, 47, 44, 43, 42, 44, 45, 39, etc etc ad nauseum. Now if gaming is your thing you're definitely going to want to be able to play your games at full res but if you want to be able to record those then you're going to need a way of separating the system resources used for your games from any system resources that would be used for recording the same. Now in order to pull that off you're going to need a second computer with a decent amount of horsepower and you're going to need something like this. This is an Inagini HDMI slash DVI to USB 3.0 capture dongle and the way these things work are pretty slick. On the recording computer, it has to be USB 3.0 capable with a powered USB 3.0 port. You just plug that in there. And then on the sending computer, or the one that you're going to be gaming on, you plug this into your video card as if it were a second monitor, either through DVI, Dual Link DVI, or HDMI. There's an adapter, HDMI to DVI adapter that comes in the box. And then you mirror that to your primary display. All the video data is then sent over the USB 3.0 bus, and then you can record from this as if it was a webcam pretty nice. Now these units are not cheap. Uh, the one that's highlighted is the one that we're discussing. So this runs for 350 bucks and unfortunately that's 50 bucks less than from when I bought mine so I'm a little butt hurt over the price drop. Yeah, <laughs> Who wouldn't be? But the capabilities of these things kind of make up for it. I mean you can do full 1080p 60 recordings and they have eight, an 8-bit eight color space and a, a YUV 422 pixel format which is better than what most people use for uh, YouTube uploads. If you want to save a little bit of money on a USB capture unit uh, that's also Linux compatible, and I will mention that this unit and the one that we're looking at here and the Inagini do not require drivers. They pretty much work like a webcam. You just plug them in and go. Uh, this Magewell unit right here is a cheaper choice at $299. Bucks. Now, I have heard that these have a tendency to run hot. Uh, I've heard that they can go for like 120 degrees Fahrenheit to up to 150 degrees Fahrenheit 
And I have heard of a couple of these units burning out on people after a few months of use. So it's not anything that you should be immediately worried about. God only knows if they were abusing it. Your results may vary. Temperature problems is something that I haven't experienced with the Inagini. I've hammered on it for a couple of days straight. The case temperature never got above 101 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, another thing that you may be considering is thinking like a Blackmagic design card. These PCIe cards are you know, kind of treated among the set of the small number of units that are capable of working on Linux machines. Now, I will mention that these things, you know, I did purchase one of these and I used it for a little while, or at least tried to. They're very finicky. They require proprietary drivers. They output video in a proprietary format that you can't really do anything with on Linux unless you... Um, download and install a specifically built version of either VLC Media Player or FFmpeg. Uh, the open broadcasting software does have a driver that's built and that comes built in with this, so that shouldn't be a problem, but FFmpeg, these things are too much stress for the cost, so they're a little more expensive than the, um, currently a little more expensive than that Magewell unit. Uh, they're a little bit cheaper than the Anagini unit, but then again, I'd still recommend that you stay away from these things. Now, as far as the Inagini unit that I have goes, I did another demonstration, going back to Tribes 2, just to give you an idea of the video quality that comes out of that. So, uh, I've used a pretty cheap computer I picked up at a recycler. It was a, a Dell Precision workstation running a quad-core Xeon processor, though it's about two generations older than my main rig here. I'm still able to run full 60 frame per second, uh, you know, 1920 by 1080 at 60 frame per second recordings on that using the super fast preset preset without any frame drops so it does the job for me and also that pc was only 150 bucks so <laughs> that plus the cost of a uh, usb 3.0 pcie card i was still running under 200 bucks worth of computer equipment and 400 bucks worth of capture equipment so a 600 dollars initial investment if you think about it that way anyway have a look judge for yourself I actually think this looks considerably better than using the X11 grab capture that I showed you earlier, but I will leave that up to you to judge. And we're back to wrap things up and let's do so with some tips now this is just kind of a summary of everything that the video went over so bear with me it's gonna be worth it I swear to God <laughs> now to avoid audio and video desynchronization for single input recordings for like X11 grab only use dash frame rate instead of dash R now I did mention that I switched back over to using dash R that's because I'm confident in my uh, libx 264 settings that I'm not gonna drop frames but 
that possibility is always going to be there. So if you want to make absolutely 100% certain you're not going to end up with an uh, audio video desynchronization, go ahead and use dash frame rate. Now for multi-input recordings, like using a webcam overlay with your X11 grab, and this is a subject for another video, you really need to use dash R on all inputs. The reason for that being is because uh, whenever you're using an overlay, when you're using dash frame rate on multiple live video inputs, a lot of conflicting timestamp information gets passed through down the line to the video encoder and the muxer, and it creates a general mess. The only real way to avoid that general mess and potential frame drops from one of your video sources, it could be X11 grab, could be the webcam overlay, one of them could lock up while the other one just sits there um, and rolls along at an oddball frame rate. You really need to use dash R on those. However, you need to tune your script, your recording script, to make sure that you prevent frame drops. So, summarizing everything that we've covered there. In your recording script, turn on logging. Just one more time, here's that FF report variable that I mentioned previously. You do need to make certain that you put this before the actual FFM command, uh, FFmpeg command in your script. And if you want to have uh, log level information that mirrors your terminal output, use either a log level name of info or a number of 32. Choosing an appropriate preset. Just remember that these presets determine how fast the encoder is. The faster the encoder, the lighter the system load, but the larger the file size. Start with very fast, then move to super fast if your system can't keep up. Ultra fast may be necessary in extreme cases and will use the most disk. Use a higher CRF value. The higher the value, the lighter the load, but at a reduction in video quality. The sane range is 18, which is considered to be visually lossless, to 28, which is considered to be passable, while the default is 23. If you do not set a CRF value in a X, uh, LibX264 string, it'll default to 23. Now, as I've demonstrated, using CRF24 produces pretty good results. I'm very satisfied with those. Another thing, use a lower frame rate, and this is important to note. I don't know what you're running for uh, a system or how many systems you have or what your system's capabilities are, but I will mention that not all computers are capable of run recording real-time video at 60 frames per second. Bear in mind, YouTube accepts a variety of frame rates, including but not limited to 15, 24, 25, 30, 48, 50, and 60. So you could go ahead and cut down your frame rate from 60 to 50 and see if that suits your needs. Maybe it looks good. Depends on what you're recording. 30 frames per second may be better suited for your project. Like I said, if you're doing basic podcasting kind of stuff or you're just recording yourself writing some scripts, you really don't need to do full HD 60 frame per second video of that. So kind of take that into consideration. And also, consider setting thread queue size to a higher value than the default for your video inputs. Uh, recommended, uh, double the value until thread message queue blocking warning stops. As I mentioned, I tried 16, 32, and then 64. Setting an arbitrarily large number does not seem to have any benefit, and it has a tendency to lead to additional errors. Uh, note that pulse audio inputs have a tendency to throw warnings regardless of the thread queue size value and can be generally ignored. Okay. Some additional tips when you're doing uh, single machine recording. So you're recording your video to the uh, same machine that uh, you're producing content on. So either you're recording a game, you're playing on the same machine, however it works out. Before you start your recording, make certain all programs to be recorded, like games, are running before you start FFmpeg. Now this will make certain that CPU and memory resources are already allocated to those programs and they can cut down on frame drops one may experience when starting a program cold. I mentioned that as an example, like if I started up a web browser and went to YouTube when a recording was already running and I was using a super fast or a very fast preset, I ended up running into frame drops. Also, make certain programs which will not be included in your recording are closed. Um, Per good example of this, programs that can ram uh, randomly demand CPU time, such as browsers open to dynamically freshing web pages, they can cause load increases that may impact recording resources. If you get a CPU spike, you can end up dropping frames, so close everything you don't need. Consider turning off desktop compositing. Now, doing so can cut down on system CPU and GPU usage and also produce smoother results in your video. 
I will mention that I am running XFCE as my desktop of choice, and I'm using its default desktop compositor. It is not the best compositor in the world. Your experience may vary. Also, consider bumping your system CPU frequency scaling governor from on-demand or power save, that depends on what chip you're running, to performance. Now, a command that you can, a very common command that you can use to do this is sudo cpu power frequency dash set dash g performance. The cpu power utility is part of the Linux based tools. It should be included in your distro regardless as to what it is. Go ahead and try that. It should work. Now, another thing, if installed, stopping the Linux thermal daemon can help. Now, this is an, uh, an optional um, program that people can load to help kind of manage their, temp their CPU temperatures on their systems. It is not installed by default. It's a definite option. Now, I am running a system D based system, and I do have this installed, so I run sudo system control stop thermal D before I start a recording. And then I hope that my CPU doesn't overheat. Thankfully, it hasn't been a problem. Now, going for using a second PC for, for recordings does require an investment. I do recommend that you use a USB 3.0 capture unit over a PCIe card like the Blackmagic Design one that I mentioned. Uh, these things will run three to four hundred dollars. Just kind of round up the four hundred bucks just in case that Inogeni price goes back up. It might. It might be on sale right now. I'm going to remain butthurt over that 50 bucks. <laughs> that is my right to remain butthurt over that 50 bucks. <laughs> anyway, for a dedicated recording PC, the more CPU horsepower available, the better. So, you know, if you have like an older gaming machine or even a current gaming machine that isn't currently being used, go ahead and use that. However, you do not have to break the bank. So you can check PC recyclers or eBay for viable hardware on the cheap. For example, the system that I used, a Dell Precision T3500 workstation cost me 150 bucks. A USB 3.0 PCIe host card cost me another 25 bucks. So I spent $175 total on a machine that I can use for uh, dedicated recordings. Now, that Precision workstation is running a Xeon W3565. As I mentioned, it's two generations older than my Ivy Bridge, so it's running in the Nehalem architecture. 3.2 gigahertz, so it's 200 megahertz slower than my uh, Ivy Bridge. And it's still another eight logical cores that I can throw into recording. RAM, it only has a quarter of what I have in my main rig, so four gigabytes of DDR3 at 1333. Uh, even with those lowered specs, I can still record 1080p at 60 frames per second using the uh, super fast preset without frame drops. Now the most important thing out of all this that I want to mention, there is no one size fits all solution when configuring an FFmpeg recording script. You need to test and see what your system is capable of doing. You need to figure out what type of settings your system can handle whenever you're running these recordings. So, and of course that leads to my favorite statement of all, reckless experimentation leads to better living. <laughs> so go ahead and experiment recklessly. Seriously, it's necessary. Play around. Use FFmpeg as a toy. Use X11 Grab Recordings as a toy. Just try to figure out what your system is capable of doing, and then you'll have a better time going forward. Anyway, hopefully this was helpful, and until the next time, I'm Mr. What, and I'm hitting Q.